so uh, welcome everyone and uh, thank you ganesh for uh, giving this keynote so uh, everyone knows who ganesh is but again as a background alvadi ganesh is an associate professor in the school of mathematics at the university of uh, bristol his research interests are in uh, queuing theory uh, broadly speaking large divisions random graph dynamics and decentralized algorithms he won the best publication award uh, at informs 2005 and the best paper award at sigmetrix uh, in 2010 and he is also co-author of a monograph on big queues so today his keynote is uh, on a very very interesting topic which is on collective decision making where lots of agents come together to arrive at a decision uh, under noise uncertainty and imperfect uh, information so this has lots of real world implications and applications and uh, ganesh has done some fascinating work on it and we are really grateful that he has agreed to give this keynote and tell us about uh, all the interesting things in collective decision making ganesh uh, the floor is yours and as, just before that uh, if you have any questions please join the slack channel uh, danilo has posted the link on uh, the chat uh, if you are already there on the slack channel you can post your questions there and uh, at the end of the talk i'll i'll relay those questions for ganesh Thank okay. you. Um, thanks, Vishal, for the generous introduction, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak here. Um, in addition to what Vishal said, I also wanted to add that if you want to unmute yourself and ask questions, that's also fine with me, especially for uh, short clarification type questions. Uh, so today I'll be uh, speaking about collective decision making. It's a very broad area and i'm only going to touch upon a very small amount of it that i've worked on um, but i'll uh, also say a bit more about the area broadly so i'll start with some motivation uh, it's a uh, it's a collective decision making is uh, is a ubiquitous phenomenon for example in biology you see it in uh, how birds flock or how uh, uh, fish school uh, you also see it in social insects like bees and ants they they decide collectively where to forage and when they move nest they all have to move to the same place so there are advantages to them uh, engaging in these collective behaviors rather than individually doing their own thing uh and you also you even see it in bacteria which you might think of as not having the capability to make such decisions but they sense the density of neighboring bacteria and decide uh, uh which genes to express based on the density so uh you see this phenomenon across the biological world uh so to uh, paraphrase ella fitzgerald birds do it bees do it even educated bacteria do it uh and uh, i won't ask whether you and i do it because we do too we also engage in collective behaviors uh so this is uh we can observe this for instance in how uh, products or technologies diffuse which product among competing ones gets adopted such as Uh, a famous example in economics is which of two video recording formats uh, VHS or Betamax was adopted and this was not primarily driven by differences in quality but uh, but one of them gained an advantage and so more products were uh, more films were made for it and so more people adopted it and so on and so it became something that drove itself Uh, so that's an example of a uh, uh, of uh, some kind of pattern emerging out of collective behavior uh okay and then there are a number of other uh, uh, phenomena like uh, which uh, uh, as to what is popular not only in uh, in say in fashions but also in our communities there are fashions as to uh, which areas are popular and these are driven often by uh, uh by the collective uh, decisions of a large number of people uh, there have also been studies of crowd movements so people have uh, 
say, uh, placed hazardous items in a, uh, in a railway station or a football stadium and looked at how uh, people observe this and change the pattern of movement to avoid it. And so this spreads out very far beyond who can actually observe this uh, item uh, and affects how, uh, how pedestrians move around this area, for instance. Uh, and then there have also been a lot of studies about herding in stock markets, and I've put a question mark because this is quite controversial. Uh, if uh, agents are rational, there should be no herding. People should make rational decisions about the value of a stock rather than copying other traders. Uh, but uh, there have been claims that indeed herding is present in stock prices, uh, though that's controversial. So these are some uh, motivating examples of where collective phenomena are found. Uh, and, okay, what aspects of collective behavior are we interested in? So there are two kinds of questions. So, so why does it arise? Uh, one reason is that agents have different information. So uh, in a flock of birds, a, a bird at one end of a flock might spot a predator or might spot a food source or something and might uh, want to signal this to other agents in the flock so that they move accordingly. Uh, also with, uh, uh, so there's a famous example uh, involving Sir Francis Colton, who uh, was one of the founders of statistics and apparently he visited a country fair and there was a prize for guessing the weight of a bull. Uh, and uh, uh, so people had to write down their uh, guess on a piece of paper and put it into a, into a box. And he looked at the, what people had put in and the average calculated from that was closer than the best guess. And this phenomenon uh, has come to be known as the wisdom of crowds. There is, of course, no guarantee this happens. This may not happen, but uh, sometimes th there's this notion that collectively we, uh, we know more than we know individually. And that's one reason to uh, uh, make collective decisions. Uh, another context, uh, which I won't speak about today is, uh, is where the optimal action for one agent depends on those of others. And this is, uh, this is what game theory typically studies. Uh, classical game theory is more about, uh, has involved a very small number of agents, maybe even two. Uh, and in many applications, what we are interested in is a large population of agents. And that's, that uh, fits in more within the paradigm of collective behavior. Uh, but this is not something I'll speak about today. And, but just to mention the, explain the term. So congestion externality is what you have in say transport networks or communication networks. If more people use the same resource, it gets congested. So you want to somehow ensure that people spread out across different resources. Uh, and network externalities are the opposite. If more people use the same uh, social network, then you can talk to your friends on it, share information with them more easily. Uh, or if more people adopt a video recording format, then it's more profitable to make programs for it. So uh, here there's, there's an incentive for more people to use the same, uh, the same network rather than different network. Okay, so the, these are more game theoretic concepts. So these are some of the why questions of collective behavior, and then there's the how question. So how, how does a collective arrive at a decision? Uh, one approach is follow the leader. So uh, someone is the leader, everybody sends their information uh, or their uh, preferences to the leader, and the leader collects all this information and achieves the best possible decision. Uh, this, this is not going to be interesting to us and we won't look at this. Uh, the second one is where agents do something very simple. They simply copy other agents, but maybe they slightly modify it. Maybe they have private information uh, on the basis of which they modify what they copy from others. And this largely is what we are going to look at today. 
And then there's a third approach. So, the, so here the agents are extremely simple and you could imagine ants or bees doing this. And the third is uh, uh, the other extreme. So in the first case, the individual agents do nothing. Here they do a little bit. And the third case is when they uh, are quite powerful themselves. So uh, they choose their best action. So they, they aggregate limited information from other agents maybe, but they aggregate it perfectly and do the, the most rational thing with that information. Um, again, uh, there's, there's a lot of interesting work on this, but I won't be talking about this today. Uh, okay, so uh, there are a variety of models we can consider already within the context of what I've discussed. Uh, and uh, uh, what the, the way they differ is in how what information the agents have about the environment and how they share that information. Uh, so at one extreme, agents get their own information from the environment, but they don't share it with anyone else. They just make their own decisions. Um, that's not, that doesn't really lead to interesting collective behavior. Uh, but we already get very interesting behavior when there's very limited information sharing. So maybe agents engage in pairwise interactions to share information or small group interactions. Uh, and in fact, pairwise interactions are mostly what we are going to look at. Another way they could interact is uh, not by explicitly talking to each other or communicating with each other, but leaving signals in the environment. And this is uh, this is famously what ants do. They leave pheromone, pheromone trails in the environment, which uh, get reinforced. Uh, so an ant goes to a food source, if it finds food, then on the way back, it leaves a trail uh, of pheromones, which gradually uh, evaporate over time. But meanwhile, another ant wandering around seeing this trail uh, has a signal which it can uh, follow uh, along its gradient to, uh, to find the food source. Uh, so that, that's a very, uh, interesting mechanism as well and leads to a form of reinforcement learning uh, and okay again that's something else I won't have time to talk about today but there's been interesting work on that as well and then the other way is not to uh, uh, communicate explicitly but simply to observe the actions of other agents and copy them or reinforce them. So this is quite similar to some of the things we are speaking about. Uh, OK, so that was a very broad overview of uh, the kinds of problems that are interesting within uh, collective behavior. Uh, and what are the research, uh, research questions here? Uh, so one form of question is, here is an optimization problem. Uh, which we want this collection of agents to solve. Uh, and we are typically interested in a large population of agents. Uh, they can communicate with each other, but maybe only a limited amount. The agents might also be very limited in terms of computation. Uh, this is true both for uh, biological agents and for uh, artificial agents like robots that we are going to think about. And then they may also have different information available to them. And somehow this information has to be pulled. So these, these are the aspects that we want to look at. So that's one kind of question. And this is perhaps the most interesting for our community in OR and engineering. Um, other kinds of questions within this broad area are also about, uh, uh, so we might know about agents uh, we might know how they behave at the microscopic level. We might know what insects do. We might know what neurons do. For instance, a neuron might be uh, modeled quite well as a leaky integrator, which integrates, reaches a threshold, fires, 
and then starts uh, integrating again, uh, accumulating charge from other neurons. So then you can ask, given these microscopic behavioral rules, when you connect up a large number of these agents, uh, what kind of macroscopic patterns emerge? Uh, again, a uh, very interesting uh, field of research, which I won't have much to say about. Uh, and another thing, the, the inverse problem is also interesting, and this is perhaps most interesting for biologists or social scientists who observe macroscopic patterns and want to figure out how, uh, how agents might behave which give rise to these macroscopic patterns. So what do bacteria do? Uh, what genes in bacteria uh, influence quorum sensing and how, how do they work? So, but I'll focus on the first problem today. Okay, so this is the, so that was a long introduction and this is the plan of the rest of the talk. So I'm going to look at a very simple problem. We have several options and we want to choose the best one. Uh, and I'm going to look at two versions of it. One is when we have a small number of options to choose amongst and for that I will be looking at variants of the water model, which I introduced. And another is when we have a very large number of options of, of the same uh, scaling uh, at the same rate as the number of agents. And for that, I'm going to look at uh, variants of bandit algorithms. Okay, so water model variants. Uh, so here's the problem statement. You have a large number of agents N, and you can think of the agents as sitting at the vertices of a graph. And I'll use the terms graph and network interchangeably. V is the vertex set, E is the edge set. And they all have to agree on one option within a small set. And for convenience, we'll just look at a set with two options. The ideas are the same if you have three or five or 10 options, but, but a million options is different. So it's important they agree. It's preferable that they agree on the best option, but okay, it's more important they agree. So for instance, if bees are going out foraging, they all want to go to the same patch. Uh, if, it's like, if it's the second best patch, maybe it's not so bad. And also we won't seek deterministic guarantees, but just probabilistic ones. So can we say that uh, we choose the better option with probability 0.9 or 0.99? How well can we do? Uh, and we look at two versions of this problem. So one is I call the static version. So here you only get, the agents only get information at the beginning. So you are told that, uh, so let's say your scouts go out from your nest of uh, bees, they, they forage two sites, they come back and they each say this one is better or that one is better. Uh, and you get initial information, but no new information. And so the goal is to reach consensus on the initial majority value, let's say, the value that most people initially prefer. So if everyone gets independent information from uh, nature, uh, the majority is the better decision. And so the best way to aggregate all the information you have is to reach consensus on the majority value. Uh, so that's one version of the problem. And the dynamic version is that uh, agents don't just get information at the beginning of the process, but they repeatedly get information and the, this has to be somehow incorporated. Okay. And again, the goal is to reach consensus on the best option. And here, because you're getting new information by postponing your decision, you improve the chance of reaching consensus on the better option. So you, there's a trade-off, but you want to do it quickly and, and to quantify this trade-off. How well can you do within a given time? Okay, so let's start with the static problem of consensus and I'll introduce the uh, what's called the water model for this. I believe it was first studied in statistical physics. Um, so you have a population of N voters, let's say they each have an opinion or preference in the set of two options. 
and they are going to update their preferences in this very simple way. Uh, there's an alarm clock at each voter. Uh, so each voter waits for a random time, exponentially distributed with parameter one. Uh, and when their clock rings, they are going to contact one of their neighbors. Uh, so if we, uh, in this case, we are thinking of the complete graph. So you contact someone else uniformly at random and you simply adopt their opinion. Okay, you're very easy to persuade you you believe whatever the last person you talked to told you. And all voters do the same thing. Okay, if this graph is connected, then in the long run, only one of two things can happen. Event eventually, everybody believes one or everybody believes zero. And after that, because you're only copying others, you cannot change, so you've reached consensus. Uh, there's a model in biology, in population genetics, uh, where you have a population of alleles and something similar happens. You, you have alleles dying after a random lifetime. And when they die, they, they are replaced by a copy of another allele chosen uniformly at random. So the population size stays constant over time, uh, but periodically uh, the alleles are cha change due to births and deaths. Uh, this is called the Moran model. It's a continuous time model, and there's, it's the continuous time analog of the Wright-Fisher model. And both these are very popular models in population genetics. And this is called neutral because the two alleles, the two types of the gene are equally fit. You don't preferentially change from one to the other. And if, if you have a preferential change, that's called a selective model. But this is neutral uh, because there's, there's no preference. And what biologists were interested in is drift. How does the proportion of alleles of the two types change over time just because of random genetic drift? Uh, but for us, uh, you, you may already have recognized that this is exactly the same as the water model that we talked about. Uh, and so you can ask the same questions about what's the probability of reaching consensus on one of the possibilities and how long does it take. Okay, uh, and you can also put this model on a graph rather than on the complete graph. And here you could possibly have different rates for contacting different neighbors. You, you could pick them uniformly at random from all your neighbors, or you could have different rates. And in general, we can, uh, for the neutral model, it turns out that it's quite easy to work out fixation probabilities and fixation times. Uh, and the reason it's easy to work these out is because there's a nice martingale associated with this, even on graphs. Uh, you can get bounds on times. You can get very accurate results on times for the complete graph, and you can get bounds for general graphs. And this has to do with the duality. There's a backwards, if you look at the water model backwards in time, uh, it corresponds to coalescing random walks. And uh, you can exploit this duality to get uh, bounds on the consensus time in general and uh, pretty much exact expressions in special cases with a, with a lot of symmetry. Okay, and I think that's what I'm saying here. Okay, so you can do these calculations. They are not hard, but the main takeaway message is the following. If you work with this uh, neutral Moran model or, the, or this voter model where there's no preference for a zero or a one, then the probability of reaching consensus on one is proportional to the initial fraction of one voter. So, so if you want 99% chance of reaching consensus on the initial majority, this, is, this doesn't guarantee it. If the initial majority is 60%, you only have 60% chance of picking the majority. And so this is somehow poor performance. And it's also slow. The consensus time on general connected undirected graphs is polynomial in N. On the complete graph, it's linear in N. Uh, but anyway, it's uh, it's pretty slow. It grows for, for large populations. It takes a long time to reach consensus. And you're 
chance of picking the majority value is not terribly high. Okay. So this, this seems like a bad mechanism for consensus, but it turns out that small modifications of the voter model give you uh, uh, nice mechanisms for consensus. Uh, so let me mention one of, there have been several of these, uh, and I'm not um, uh, doing a comprehensive survey, so uh, uh, I apologize to all those whose work I'm not mentioning, but I'm just going to say a bit that uh, uh, bit of work that I did with James Cruz. So the model we looked at is, uh, is the following. So instead of, a, uh, if I'm a voter in this model, instead of talking to one person and adopting their opinion, what I'm going to do is pick two people, say uniformly at random, uh, ask for their opinion. If one of them agrees with me, I'll keep my opinion. But if both of them disagree with me, I'll change my opinion. So I have some preference for my current opinion. So it takes two people to change my mind. Or more generally, I could pick M people, say five, and I only change my mind if at least three of them have a different opinion from me. So, so you have a whole family of models parameterized by how many people you talk to and how big a majority it takes to persuade you. Okay. Uh, and for these, what we can show uh, is that you are very likely to reach consensus on the majority value. So the probability of reaching consensus on the minority value decays exponentially in the population size. I should have said exponentially in what? In the population size. So if, if you have a large population, then somehow uh, uh, having a large population does help you in, uh, uh, in picking the majority value. Um, and also uh, the, the time to reach, cons you reach consensus quickly. You only need time logarithmic in the population size rather than exponential. This is for the complete graph. Uh, or, okay, ideally for the complete graph, but if you don't have the complete graph, but you have a way of uh, sampling uniformly from the population, that's good enough. So you are somehow emulating the complete graph by sampling uniformly. Uh, this can be done quickly on expanders, but it's quite slow on other graphs. So uh, that sampling process might itself be quite long for other graphs. Okay, so these are our main results. You can uh, uh, you can uh, select the majority opinion with uh, probability close to one, uh, and you can do so quickly. And also, this uh, parameterization gives you a trade-off. So if I pick uh, two people, then uh, Okay, so the larger the value of M I pick, the, the more likely I am to reach consensus on the uh, majority. So the error exponent gets bigger, uh, but it also takes me longer. So this gives you this gives you a way of trading off between the two things. Uh, okay, and, and uh, this sort of idea, not, not just this version of the water model, but other similar variants have been used in a number of uh, different applications. Uh, so very topically nowadays in distributed ledgers, and there's nice work of Julia Fanti and others on uh, such applications. And in the same context as well, there's been work on dealing with uh, Byzantine faults or malicious agents. Uh, but again, by a number of people. So I'm just picking uh, one particular paper that looked at this. Okay. And then there's, uh, I'm also going to talk about some more work I've been doing on applying similar methods to robot swarms. Uh, okay, so let me again start by describing the problem. So we have uh, these quite tiny robots which can cooperate on tasks. Uh, and so you should think of there being a very large number of them of the order of a few hundred to a few thousand. Uh, and they are so small that they, they are very limited in their power, their communication range, 
their computational capabilities, etc. So you want them to do very simple things. And uh, you want them to cooperate to perform some task. And the idea is, uh, can you use the fact that there are lots of them to uh, uh, achieve somehow powerful collective behavior? And again, we are just going to look at the problem of deciding the better of two options. Uh, so A and B, and each robot picks one of these at random. Uh, it measures the quality of its uh, option. Uh, and we look at two cases where whether the measurement is noisy or noiseless. Uh, and then the swarm has to reach consensus on one of these two options. Okay, and uh, we started with, there's been a lot of work in this community and we picked an algorithm that's popular in the community, which was inspired by social insects. And the algorithm is the following. So a robot picks an option, A, let's say, it measures its quality, it gets some number Q hat A for, for its measure. And so for an exponential time with mean equal to its quality measure, it's going to advocate this option. It's going to signal this option. And then at the end of this time, its clock goes off and then uh, it picks a random number and asks, what option do you prefer? And then it simply copies it. So it's like a voter model, except that instead of all the agents having the same clock rate, they have a clock rate which depends on the measure of the quality of the option. Okay. So if you think it's a good quality, you take a long time before you change your mind and change, yeah, before you change your opinion. And if, it, if your estimate is the quality is poor, you wait a short time and then copy someone else. So that's the only change. And again, we can ask the same questions of uh, consensus probabilities and times. So in the noise-free case, we'll assume that the quality you measure is the true quality of, your, of the site. And let's say site A is option A is better. Uh, and because you, if your measurement is noise-free, there's no need for repeating measurements. You gain no new information. Uh, so you just measure it once. And then this model turns out to be the model I just described is a variant of the water model called the weighted water model, or it's a, in the biological, uh, in the population genetics literature, this is the Moran model with selection. One of the alleles is better. Uh, it has higher fitness, so it's uh, selected. It's preferentially selected during reproduction. Okay, and we'll also look at the noisy case later where these are at each time, each time you potentially change your mind or each time you talk to another agent, you also get a fresh sample of the quality which are IID drawn from these distributions. Okay, so the noiseless case is a straightforward calculation. Again, there's a nice martingale uh, which you can use to show that you uh, reach consensus on the better option with high probability. So the probability of reaching consensus on the worst option decays exponentially. And it decays exponentially here in the number of agents which initially prefer the uh, better option. So if you start with the reasonable number initially preferring the better option, you are very likely to reach consensus on that. Uh, and the time to reach consensus again is logarithmic. It also depends on the isoperimetric constant of your graph. This, this is how long it takes for information to spread. This is fairly standard. Okay, and we can also extend these results to uh, okay, so these are exact results for the complete graph or for regular graphs, uh, but we can extend them to graphs which are close to regular. So D, if D min and D max are not very far apart, uh, then we can extend the results. Okay, I think I've said already, yeah, there's an exponential martingale for this. Um, 
and consensus time bombs are easy. And in fact, we, these results are not new to us. These were already obtained earlier for the Moran model with selection, which is essentially the same. They seem to be new to the swarm robotics community because there are a lot, lot of papers looking at this model, essentially doing simulations, and there has been no theoretical analysis so far. Uh, we made some extensions to approximately regular graphs, but we, but also to the noisy case, which which I'll talk about soon. Uh, and the other thing I should mention is that the simulation suggests that the results are even better than we can prove for the approximately regular graphs. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let me say a bit about the noisy case, and I'm going to say something mainly the large population limit. Uh, so let's suppose that initially just one single robot picks the better option. Uh, so what happens, it, it uh, signals this option for a while. Meanwhile, there's a huge number of robots which preferred option B. Some of them are going to change their minds. They pick somebody at random. The chance of picking the single robot is small. Uh, but there are a lot of them. So overall, some order one of them will pick this before it, uh, while it holds this initial opinion. Uh, and so they'll switch to this option. And it could be zero, it could be zero, but it could be a small number. Uh, and so let's call them the children of this initial robot. And then each child is again going to take a noisy estimate of the quality, so it picks from this distribution, and that we'll call that the type of the child. Its quality estimate is going to be its type. And then when this first robot stops signaling, now there are there's a huge population with preference B, order one with preference A, so almost certainly it's going to switch to option B. So it's going to, let's say, it dies. So if you keep track of the number of robots who prefer option A, the better option, it behaves like a branching process. And you have to keep track of the type, the quality estimate. Uh, and so essentially the question of uh, whether this, um, eventually in order to reach consensus on A, this branching process should not become extinct. Uh, and somehow, if it doesn't become extinct, uh, uh, so if you, basically two kinds of things happen to branching processes. Either they die exponentially or they grow exponentially. Uh, and except for one parameter value exactly at the boundary, these are the only two behaviors. So essentially, if this, this doesn't go extinct, it takes over and the A robots win and you reach consensus on this. Uh, so the probability of not reaching consensus on the best value is the extinction probability of this branching process. That's the reasoning. Uh, okay, and so I've said all this. Uh, and you can calculate this extinction probability quite explicitly. It's, uh, it has to be done numerically by solving a fixed point equation, but you can, but it's not hard to do. So it's quite easy to do. Uh, you can only do it for finite number of types. So if you have a continuous distribution for quality, you can, you have to approximate it uh, by, a, by a distribution supported on, uh, on a finite uh, set and then take the limit and, and it all works. Uh, and again, the analysis is somewhat heuristic, but simulations show that the branching process analysis uh, is a very good fit even for medium-sized populations of the order of a few tens. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about water model variance. Uh, I'd, I'd also like to speak a bit about bandit problems and I realize I'm running slow, so I'll try to speed up. So now we are interested in the other extreme where there are a lot of options. And again, let's start with a toy motivating example. Uh, say you have uh, 
a special visitor and you want to take them to the best restaurant in your city and you want to find this. And let's say that best is well defined, that people don't differ in their taste. So everybody agrees on the ranking, except it's unknown. Um, and not only do they have the same ranking, they would assign the same numerical scores to restaurants. So rankings are consistent with a numerical measure. So I go to a restaurant, I get a, ran a random numerical score with mean equal to its true quality, but with some noise. Uh, and uh, I want to decide what's the best restaurant. But OK, but this is hard because unless you are in a very small place, there are too many restaurants to try, try them all out. And what would you do? You'd ask your friends for suggestions, etc. And that's what we are going to do. Uh, other examples, how, how do websites display ads? Again, you might have very geographically distributed websites, uh, but they have common search terms, common ads to display. Uh, can they decide what's the best ad to display for a given search term without exchanging all possible huge amounts of information for what happened for every search? and other examples which uh, okay so i won't say much about that and there are two sorts of questions one is how to make optimal decisions and again this is the sort of question that's of interest to the orcs engineering community uh, and the other question is how do real uh, human beings or other agents make decisions and that might be of more interest to economists and social scientists and biologists, but I'll talk about the first problem. Uh, so in case you have never come across multi-armed bandits before, here is a very quick overview of them. So you have some set of finite set of actions. Uh, time is discrete and every time you pick an action, you play it, you get a random reward. Uh, but you only observe the reward for the action you played. You don't know for the action you did, for the restaurant you didn't visit, you don't know how good it is. And based on that, you have to decide what to do in each time step. And so there's a trade-off between exploration and exploitation. You want to do, you want to go to what you think is a better restaurant, but you also want to explore restaurants which Maybe the one time you went, it was bad, but they may have been having a bad day. You want to give them another chance. <coughs> okay, and what's the objective? You want to minimize what's called regret in the long term. And your regret is the difference between the reward you would have got if you had always played the best time in expectation, made the best choice in expectation and the expected reward you actually got. And what I want to emphasize is there's an expectation involved both for, uh, in both cases. You're, you're comparing expectations, not the sample path reward. Um, and the motivation, the reason for defining regret this way is that the only thing that's, that you can learn is expectation. Uh, that there's randomness in the sample path which can't be learned and somehow it's unfair to take that into your figure of merit. Uh, we can discuss this whether th this is the correct thing to do or not, but this is the standard thing in the literature. Uh, as an example, Bernoulli rewards, you have arms with parameters mu i of success, uh, which are mu one is the best arm, etc. cetera, K arms. Uh, and this is your regret. If, if you had played mu one every time, this is the reward you've got. This is what you actually got by playing different arms in different time steps. Okay. So there are two questions we want to ask. What are the fundamental lower bounds that any algorithm would uh, what's the fundamental minimum regret any algorithm would incur? And are there efficient algorithms which can achieve this? Uh, and this problem goes back a long time and Lyon Robbins already proved this fundamental lower bound on the regret, I think in 59. 
and they showed that it scales logarithmically in your time horizon. Uh, it depends on the gap between the best arm and the reward on your arm. So if there's a big gap, you incur a big regret, but if there's a big gap, they are easy to distinguish, so that helps you. Uh, and this thing in the denominator is the relative entropy or the KL divergence between these two Bernoulli distributions. Okay, and uh, you might be familiar, this plays a role in hypothesis testing. So essentially, this, this is a version of the hypothesis testing problem, uh, sequential hypothesis testing. So it's not surprising this uh, arises. <coughs> So these are the fundamental lower bounds. Uh, what, what can algorithms achieve? And in the single agent case, it's known that a number of algorithms are known, both frequentist and Bayesian, which achieve the correct scaling logarithmic in the time horizon. Uh, and you can even achieve the best constant in front of the logarithm. That's harder, but, but it's been done. Uh, so, okay, so what I wanted to emphasize is that uh, for multi arm banded problems, uh, there is no gap between what's information theoretically possible and what's computationally possible. You can achieve what's the best information theoretic bound with computationally efficient algorithms. Uh, so, the multi agent setting, we have a large number of arms, large number of agents. Uh, and we want to now minimize the regret aggregated over all the agents and what can we do? Um, so again, let's talk about lower bounds and efficient algorithms. So there are two extremes. Now, if every agent were acting independently, every agent could do what they could do in the single agent case. So they they can achieve this regret by a single agent algorithm. There are n agents, so this is the aggregate regret. So this is achievable by the naive option of not communicating with anyone else. Uh, now, if you could communicate, if there were no constraints on communication, then the whole collective behaves like a single agent. You can tell everyone everything. Uh, in that case, in t time steps, there are nt decisions to make. There's one super agent making nt decisions, and this is the regret, the lion robin's lower bound on the regret of the super agent. Okay, and so the n has gone from outside the sum to within the log. Uh, so this is essentially log n plus log t, and you you have pretty much saved a factor of n. So there's a huge gap between the upper and lower bound. And what we wanted to do was to see if we could uh, close this gap. So how close can we get with limited communication? Uh, so th uh, there, there's a sequence of uh, papers I worked on, which I'd like to mention. So uh, this work started when I visited Sanjay Shakota in, in UT Austin in 2019 or 2018 even, and we worked with a, a former student at UT Austin, Abhishek Sankar Raman. Uh, and um, so the, the results we got were, we, we, so we came up with an algorithm which achieved the correct log t scaling almost. So instead of k log t, there was this extra factor. And then there was also a constant term. Uh, we are typically interested in the number of agents being proportional to the number of arms or having a polynomial with maybe ex exponent bigger than one or smaller than one, but a polynomial relation between them. And then essentially you are, you are close to optimal or polylog of optimal. Uh, so, so we are kind of in the right ballpark with this, but there is still a gap. We didn't quite close it. Uh, and then continuing this line of work and also generalizing it. So this, the work here was on the complete graph. We generalized it to more general graphs. Uh, and, and we did get uh, the pretty much the correct scaling. 
uh, with a logarithmic term and then a polylog uh, only in the constant term, not in the log. The log t term was uh, uh, pretty close to the line drop in slower bound and then for the constant term there was a polylog in the number of agents. Uh, and then in subsequent work here in Bristol with a colleague, Henry Reeve and a PhD student, Connor Newton, uh, we uh, in fact achieved the lion droppings lower bound here. Uh, so this, this was a line of work on uh, multi, uh, multi, on decentralized multi-arm bandits, multi-agent multi-arm bandits. Okay, and what were the algorithms which achieved this? These were quite simple algorithm. So you simply partition the arms into disjoint sets. Uh, each agent is assigned one element of this partition and place its favorite single agent algorithm on the set of arms, but also they periodically make recommendations to each other. So, so what you would intuitively expect to do, uh, how you would intuitively expect to learn in a collective uh, and these uh, the, these are quite you you only do this uh, quite sparsely so the amount of communication is very limited uh, it's sublinear uh, and then you incorporate these recommendations tentatively but then if they are not good enough you get rid of them okay and the main idea behind why this works so well is that gossip spreads quickly. And that's, uh, that's pretty much uh, the main takeaway message. So if you have uh, N agents on the complete graph, then gossip spreads within log N time slots, and this is uh, pretty robust. And if you have some other graph, uh, then the time it takes uh, scales logarithmically in N, but it also depends on uh, how well connected the graph is. So there's this parameter called its conductance, which is related to the isoperimetric constant, which we mentioned earlier. Uh, so this, de this decides how quickly the rumor spreads in the graph. Uh, and that limits how quickly uh, your different agents can learn. Okay, so those are the main problems I uh, wanted to talk about, just some related questions and open problems in the next couple of minutes. Uh, so, okay, in the static setting for uh, the water model of swarm robotics, we get uh, this exponential martingale, but that's only available for regular graphs. Uh, and just forcing that through for other graphs gives very conservative bounds. Are there other techniques that might work better? And in the dynamic case where agents were periodically reassessing the quality of the sites, we presented a branching process heuristic. We are yet to turn it into a regress limit theorem, but think we can do this using some standard large deviation techniques. Uh, but the more interesting question, which we haven't touched on is, um, are there fundamental limits on the error exponents? We get some, okay, we, we show that the error decays exponentially, which is good enough, but uh, are we doing the best we can with the amount of data we have? Uh, that, that's something we've not addressed and to the best of my knowledge, other work has not in this area has not addressed either. And then for the bandit version of the problem, okay, there is some work on improving the analysis, uh, extending it to contextual bandits. There's been some work on this already by some of my co-authors also on working with dealing with malicious nodes. Um, uh, so I'm working with my colleague and PhD student. We are looking at uh, extending it to uh, arms whose rewards are continuous on some metric space, this work can progress, and then one can imagine variants of the problem, like best arm identification. And then there are whole areas I didn't talk about at all uh, in today's talk. One of these I could mention is social learning. Here, agents don't explicitly communicate with each other, but they can uh, observe what other agents are doing. And based on that, they can try to update their beliefs. And so this is something I mentioned earlier. And here agents do the 
optimal Bayesian rational thing. And there's some interesting work recently of Elkhanan Mosel and others where they find that uh, even Bayesian optimal agents don't do better. They are not able to aggregate information uh, efficiently, let's say, as, as if they were a single agent. So are there uh, other algorithms which are maybe suboptimal at the individual agent level, which collectively do better. So that might be an interesting open question here. Okay, but I've uh, run over time, so I should stop here. I leave this up and take questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ganesh, for a fascinating talk. Uh, looking if people have questions. So uh, while people are still uh, formulating that questions, I, I had one question. In the first part uh, about swarm robotics, you mentioned that a lot of it is nature inspired. And a lot of, uh, you know, as performance analysts, so we, we always make this modeling uh, 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 sort of abstraction that we, we deal with uniformly at random or exponential timers. Do they have like a justification in uh, nature setting and what if they sort of relax those analytically practical assumptions to the results still match what we see in simulations or in practice? Uh, so one way of relaxing this assumption of uniformly at random is that you pick from amongst your neighbors on a graph. And again, we simulated this, but uh, so, so the natural graph for a uh, uh, swarm robotics problem is a random geometric graph. You, you, the robots are randomly spread over some area and you have a communication range and you can only talk within that range. Um, that, I, that might be analytically tractable, but uh, we haven't done that. And simulations do work, so you can do that. Uh, likewise, I don't think it uh, depends critically on the exponential assumption. You do need randomness, but I, I think it would, if you say picked uniform over some interval, I think you would see very similar performance, at least for large populations. Large population, right. Adam Weirman has a question. So Adam? I can ask. Hey, so I have, I have a, a, I guess maybe a sort of high level type questions, two of them. Uh, maybe maybe I'll ask the simpler one first. So it seems like that, you know, one of the technical challenges that's always present in this area is kind of generalizing like you did in your last area from, you know, complete graph to, you know, general graph to tightening the lower bound and these sorts of things. Are there, you know, some I'm teaching a course on this topic. It, what are the tools? Is there a general approach that you feel like is the you understand at this point across the topics that you test that you covered? That is like you know the thing that we should all be teaching in our courses on this topic to help people do that generalization and have the tool set for that. Uh, so we uh, in the bandits work, we basically come put together two things. One is the analysis of UCB or similar algorithms and the other was the gossip part and for the gossip part um, yeah it's it's basically uh, the spread is limited by the conductance or the isoperimetric constant so these are uh, so the, those are the graph properties that seem to matter the most um, and similarly for the voter model as well the the bounds but Okay, it may be partly driven by the fact that we we have already become used to these graph properties and we are seeking bounds involving them, but but they do seem to come up fairly naturally. But that is sort of you you do view that as sort of a general you know it's at least useful across all these tools to and, and so you find the same kind of results the same sort of analysis uh, being applied you know with with differences of course but applied applied across these models. Yeah, or it's a common analytical technique. So indeed, it, it sometimes gives very conservative bounds because when you're using these isoperimetric constants, you're saying this worst bit of the graph, the bit that's 
not communicating with the rest of the graph is the bottleneck. And it's a bottleneck for a while, but it's not a bottleneck throughout the process. So it uh, it often gives very conservative bounds, and I don't know how you get around that, but but it does play some role clearly. Cool. Thanks. And then one other one uh, while, I, while I'm on the mic. Uh, so you have, and especially in this last model, you have this notion of delay, you know, actually all the gossip models, you have this notion of delay, uh, you know, that we find out, you know, step by step as, as information spreads across. Delay in the control theoric side often is viewed as a, you know, really difficult thing to handle. And there's been a lot of progress in recent years with SLS techniques. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this kind of system level synthesis approach for doing delay, but I was, I was kind of wondering if that tool set, you, you saw any hope for using ideas from that for the gossip uh, world. I haven't, I haven't seen that bridge happen yet. Uh, no, I'm not familiar with this work, so. Okay, I'll, I'll talk to you in the breakout about it then. Yeah, but, but yeah, the only thing I wanted to say is so some of the, I guess some of it is artificial. The, the, it's kind of a way of um, breaking the communication implosion problem. So you are introducing delays to make sure that all your neighbors don't try to talk to you simultaneously. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so I think uh, I don't see any more questions on Slack or chat. Now, Danilo, how, how are you doing on time? Uh, yeah, actually, it's uh, already 6 or 5, so 